to begin. It is not without some considerable irony that as we enter the Anthropocene, the epoch named after us, we humans are becoming increasingly uncertain about what and who it is we are, about whether we can and whether we should distinguish ourselves from what and who we are not. Old distinctions and boundaries between human and animal, human and non-human, and human and machine have lost their firmness and certainty and have come under renewed suspicion and critical pressure. Some of this is due to the enormous ongoing revision of our knowledge and understanding of non-human life in general, making untenable distinctions long taken for granted. We are coming to see, finally, how complexly entangled and interdependent are human and non-human forms of life. The day has passed when questions of justice and, and the good life could be posed only in relation to human forms of life. Those questions have become all the more difficult and complex with the recognition of our entanglement and interdependence. Making sense of those questions as we extend them outward to embrace the non-human alongside and amidst which we dwell represents a conceptual and normative challenge we have never had to face before. It is an unsettling time because some fundamental questions <laughs> seem to be open again and it is unclear how we go about answering them or where the answers will take us. One would think that rethinking formerly settled distinctions and convictions, be they based on cognition, consciousness, or language, or other candidates, would bring about a renaissance in thinking about both the question of the human and the question of the non-human. After all, if who and what we take ourselves to be now depends on an unsustainable contrast, contrast with and opposition to the non-human, one would expect some revision of our self-understanding as human. But it would appear that all the energetic thinking is now taking place in relation to the non-human, which up to a point is entirely understandable. Much of this is due to a justly motivated endeavor to dislodge the dominant position of the human subject and the human species in our thinking, in short, to outgrow human exceptionalism. But there may be better and worse ways to go about this, and although it may appear counterintuitive, displacing the question of the human exclusively in favor of the non-human might unwittingly retrench rather than dislodge human exceptionalism. In the early years of this century, for a very brief time, the question of the human was a very live question. The successful mapping of the genome at the close of the previous century produced a series of an anxious reflections by philosophers and social theorists in response to the potential of genetic engineering and the new technosciences to alter fundamentally and irreversibly the very basis of what counts as a human being and what counts as a human form of life. In quick succession, Jürgen Habermas, Jacques Derrida, Francis Fukuyama, and Michael Sandel, among others, published widely read and intensely discussed books and articles on how and why the emerging techno-scientific revolution posed a threat to what is peculiarly human. But what do we say about what is peculiarly human when the conceptual boundaries between the human and the non-human person and thing have become fluid. A decade later, rather unnoticeably and without so far as I am aware any compelling explanation, this pressing question seems to have lost its urgency. It has been displaced and overtaken by a question to which an, ever greater, an even greater urgency is, is assigned. The question of the non-human, the non-human, the animal, the vital materiality of things and non-human forces, the question of Gaia, and the emergence of the Anthropocene. Only a decade later, those panic debates and concerns that coalesced around ta ta the techno-scientific threats to the very idea of the human seem very remote from our present concern. What happened and why? I think there are a few reasons, <coughs> one of which is the simple fact that we were and still remain largely unaware <coughs> excuse me, of how inseparably, inseparably and faithfully linked the question of the human is to the question of the non-human. 
one won't find in the reflections of Habermas and Bell and Fukuyama any concern whatsoever with the fate of the non-human. Nor will one find any acknowledgement that human and non-human forms of life are entangled with one another, as though the place of the non-human in human forms of life was a secondary or irrelevant question. Another reason is that we are quickly realizing that we are no longer on Holocene time. The time of the Anthropocene is also altogether different. It, it is not just human life that is pressed for time. All life is pressed for time. As humans carry on somnium, somnambulistically, as though it's business as usual on the planet, a sixth mass extinction of non-human animal life proceeds apace. You all know about the bushfires in Australia. You may have also heard that the smoke from those fires is now circling the entire planet. You may not have heard that a, a billion animals have died, and they don't know how many species will have become extinct, but they will have some extinction on their hands. We are facing anthropogenic uh, mutations of the living systems of the planet on a scale that no human civilization has faced before, mutations that are unpredictable, unpre unprecedented, possibly ungraspable in the multiple aspects and implications, something I call the anthropocenic sublime, and just as uncontrollable. So it seems hardly the time to be preoccupied rather narcissistically with the question of what it means to be human in order to reassert some new, some new version of human exceptionalism. <coughs> we are told repeatedly that we need to act and act quickly to make a difference now to the scale of the cat cat catastrophes to come that have already begun, to make them less than just, less destructive, to save, to save what we can, but at the same time, the we, we need, who needs to do all this cannot remain as it is or was. To respond to the challenges of living in and with the Anthropocene, this we needs to cultivate a new mode of humanity. But such cultivation at this scale and breadth takes time. It can only happen slowly if it can happen at all. So there are competing and conflicting temporalities in play and at stake in the judgments we make about what we are called upon to do. I want to adduce a further reason for the turn toward the non-human in the humanities and social sciences. This highly dramatic thematization of the question of, the, sorry, the highly dramatic thematization of the question of the human in the first decade of the century was in fact a deviation from the norm a blip in a very long history of uh, suppression or indifference. Thereafter, the sep subsequent emergence of a wide and rapidly increasing array of post-humanist inquiries into the non-human is consistent with the anti-humanist temper of the humanities and social sciences since the 1960s. It is no accident that the concerns of the present seem better and more urgently expressed by people like Bruno Latour Donna Haraway, and Jane Bennett, whose aim is to diminish, not to rescue, the difference between human and non-human. There are powerful moral motivations driving their efforts, ones I share, not least of which is the honorable and timely effort to overcome human exceptionalism, to which is so rightly attributed so much of the destructiveness that has brought us into the Anthropocene. But that's not the whole story. Decades of anti-humanism have left their mark on us as thinkers and on what we think is thinkable. It is not just about closing the door to any return to humanist comforts and pieties. It is about what we allow ourselves to imagine as possibilities beyond humanism and post-humanism. There is in the air and has been for some time a general sense of exhaustion with the human a sense that the time has come to su supersede the human and humanism, and you can find this expressed in various discourses throughout the humanities and social sciences. This thought was paradigmatically expressed five decades ago in the closing pages of Michel Foucault's The Order of Things. As Foucault took great pains to show in what is arguably the most extraordinary intellectual performance of the 20th century, 
the human being that became the epistemic object of the human sciences is, quote, an effect of a change in the fundamental arrangement of knowledge, the very change through which man came into being as a living, laboring, and speaking subject. Going on from Foucault, as the archaeology of our thought easily shows, man is an invention of recent date and one perhaps nearing its end. If those arrangements were to disappear, if some event of which we can at the moment do no more than sense the possibility were to cause them to disappear, as the ground of classical thought did, then one can certainly wager that man would be erased, like a face drawn in sand at the edge of the sea. Of course, Foucault's closing statement has a different ring to it now in the age of anthropogenic climate change. There are peoples and cultures living on islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans who are literally about to disappear along with their history and ways of life as the ocean levels rise. Of course, Foucault was talking about a certain ideal or figure of the human, not about the human species, not about cultures and peoples literally being erased. Certainly the dangers of, and challenges of the Anthropocene were not on the horizon of Western intellectuals back then. The event of the Anthropocene is not the event that Foucault had in mind or the kind of event he had in mind. But there is nonetheless a smug confidence in Foucault's statement that, that expresses our anti-humanist temper at the point of its ascension to the status of taken for granted doxa about humanism, an unquestioned and still unquestionable starting point for any sensible critical position. I don't think Foucault would write that sentence today. It was easier to talk like that then. We were still on Holocene time and could take for granted the stability of the climate systems and life systems of the planet. That's not the time we're on anymore. We might have been rushing headlong into the future on modernist time, recklessly not knowing where we were headed, but on Anthropocene time, the future is rushing headlong at us and we're by no means ready for it as the bushfires in Australia so dramatically demonstrate. The unprecedented challenges of the Anthropocene era are not just about the looming catastrophes threatening, threatening the Earth's living systems and all life on the planet, human and non-human. They are also challenges to the idea of the human and to human responsiveness to the non-human. The final pages of the order of things certainly presage the sense of the exhaustion of human possibility. My worry is that the exhaustion of the sense of human possibility might lead to the exhaustion of the possibility of the human. Given all that we have irresponsibly laid to waste and what we continue to lay, lay to waste, what kind of faith can we have in ourselves? As Stanley Cavell has shown, disappointment and skepticism are interlinked. Our disappointment with the human feeds on our skepticism toward the human, and our skepticism feeds on our disappointment. But what if our disappointment with, with, with the human does more than prop up our anti-humanist temper? What if it also stands in the way of our responsiveness to the non-human? This is another section of the paper. In her widely read and admired book, Vibrant Matter, Jan Jane Bennett offers an account of non-human agency that is consistent with our anti-humanist temper and at the same time in conformity with a very standard taking for granted conception of human agency. Drawing on Spinoza and Latour, Bennett ex extends and, and distributes to things and to non-human life a form of agency previously identified almost strictly with human agency. The ontological and analytical priority Bennett further attributes to non-human agency flattens deliberately the difference between human and non-human agents. Indeed, Bennett wants entirely to bracket the human and the question of human agency in order to make room for the agency of the non-human. For her, any attempt to distinguish human from non-human agency will always overshadow the vitality and agency of the non-human. 
She writes, the philosophical project of naming where subjectivity begins, begins and ends is too often bound up with fantasies of human uniqueness in the eyes of God, of escape from materiality, or of mastery of nature. And even where it is not, it remains an aporetic or quixotic endeavor. Bennett, therefore, has no interest in pursuing the question of human agency. Sooner or later, she continues, the topics of subjectivity or of what distinguishes the human from the non-human will lead down the anthropocentric garden path, it will insinuate a hierarchy of subjects over objects, and obstruct free thinking about what agency really entails. Apparently, our thinking about non-human agency is much less encumbered, encumbered sorry, by what are essentially fruitless epistemological and ontological questions. Again, from Bennett, no one really knows what human agency is or what, he, uh, sorry, is human, sorry. No one really knows what human agency is or what humans are doing when they are said to perform as agents. In the face of every analysis, human agency remains something of a mystery. If we do not know just how human agency operates, how can we be so sure that the processes through which non-humans make their mark are qualitative, qualitatively different? But if we do not really know enough about human agency, the agency which is, after all, our own, that tells us something about what and who we are, on what basis can we be confident that our grasp of non-human agency is any more secure? In what way can it be less mysterious to us than we are to ourselves? We are seeking to understand the agency of another we have previously or ignored or underestimated, an other whose otherness raises all kinds of epistemic and ethical issues for us. And yet Bennett doesn't pose, let alone answer the question of what it is that makes non-human agency less mysterious and more conceptually accessible than our own. The problem is not only that Bennett is overstating the, mis the mystery of human agency, the problem is that she di disallows any meaningful basis of comparison be be between human and non-human agency. Although one term of the comparison is rendered conceptually opaque and mysterious, it nonetheless provides the vocabulary on which the intelligibility of the other term depends. In other words, she will explain non-human agency and the vocabulary of human agency, the very vocabulary that makes human agency mysterious. So how can the conceptual language of human agency make the explanatory object of that language mysterious without also making non-human agency at least as mysterious? Why should we expect that the avowedly flawed language of human agency can illuminate non-human agency? Let me clarify further what is at issue here. Bennett espouses unquestioningly a view of agency that is indistinguishable from the standard view of agency as a doing or acting through which doing or acting an agent brings about an effect of one kind or another. In other words, what we have here in the standard picture is a causal picture of agency a view of agency that is synonymous or identical with causality. The agent is understood and understands herself as the efficient cause of something, acting on that something, any something, producing an effect that affects, alters, or redirects that on which it acts. Contrary to what Latour and Bennett believe, they are not neutralizing the distinction between human and non-human so much as they are extending to the non-human domain an already flawed and much contested picture of human agency. They do not challenge this picture, they only reproduce its shortcomings. Notice the definition of agency that is supposed to render neutral the difference between human and non-human agency uh, through the definition of what Latour calls an actant. An actant is a source of action that can be either human or non-human. 
It is that which has efficacy, can do things, has sufficient coherence to make a difference, produce effects, alter the course of events. In short, this is a causal picture of agency. Thus, what was originally a form of agency that distinguished human from non-human agents reappears as a form of agency that makes human and non-human agency indistinguishable from each other, or so it is claimed. But if this view of agency is correct, why then does Bennett claim that no one really knows what agent, what hu, sorry, what hu, sorry, that no one really knows what human agency is? Why does it remain a, mess, a mystery best left undisturbed? Clearly, it would seem more consistent for Bennett to argue that we do not know what agency is, sorry, that we do know what agency is, and the problem has been that we have been too stingy and anthropocentric to share it with non-human beings. To be an agent simply is to be a causal force, a locus of causality with the power to affect things, to produce effects, to alter the course of events. And so contrary to what we have heretofore thought, it is not a power that is restricted to or the special property specifically of human agents. The argument stated this way would be more clearly aligned with Bennett's hope that by seeing the active agentic materiality of things, we will become more responsive to the non-human. This is, after all, the whole point of her endeavor, one that I wholeheartedly endorse. Consider the way that Bennett describes that underlying goal, which is undeniably a normative project. Quote, the ethical aim becomes to distribute value more generously to bodies as such, close quote. Now, this statement not only exposes the tension between Bennett's ethical motiva motivation and the naturalistic language she deploys, the, nat the language of bodies and forces, it also exposes a further tension between Bennett's interest in re-enchanting nature and her naturalistic framework. Since the re-enchantment is undertaken in naturalistic rather than normative language, it is not surprising that the redistribution of value is one directional, from humans to the non-human. Once one abandons normative language, pri privileging, as uh, Bennett puts it, physiological over moral descriptors, the natural or non-human world is, is deprived of, a, of any value property of its own. If it is to have value at all, value must be bestowed upon it by human beings. As Akhil Bilgrami has argued, in, in this naturalistic view of value, value is understood as essentially as an extension of human desires and preferences. And it is a view that complements and reinforces a view of nature as wholly disenchanted and devoid of properties of its own. Quoting Bill Grammy, since nothing intrinsic in nature is valuable, nothing in nature can constrain our desires, utilities, <coughs> and moral sentiment, close quote. There is, in other words, nothing out there for and to which we are accountable other than the desires and preferences we ourselves project. So on this view that follows from a naturalistic um, framework, values are ours to redistribute as we desire, to whatever we desire to attribute value. We might even say, in accordance with Spinoza's view of the agency of conative bodies, that our power to distribute value is life enhancing when human bodies align their actions with the actions of non-human bodies. But we cannot say that those non-human bodies possess their own value and are themselves value distributing bodies. The values come from us. We are the value distributors. So we could choose to withhold value from non-human bodies arbitrarily or capriciously or for apparently good internal reasons of our own. It doesn't matter. We are the ones with the power to generate and distribute value. 
the beneficiaries of our value distribution, having no intrinsic value of their own, depend on us for the acquisition of value. Unavoidably, unavoidably then, if we rely on a naturalistic framework, we can't but subjectivize value. We entrench it in the value-conferring human subject and paradoxically reinforce rather than overcome human exceptionalism. In this case, we are the exceptional value-distributing agent. Bennett thus seems to be paradoxically captive to a picture of human agency that is continuous with human exceptionalism. But I think it is also a corollary of contemporary skepticism and disappointment with the human. Must we be so skeptical, not in the sense of critical, but simply suspicious ex ante of any inquiry that seeks a differentiated account of human? and non-human agency. As much as she expresses confidence about the view of agency that, that she attributes to non-human agents, Bennett also registers that there is something not quite right about her approach, but she can't quite identify what it is. It seems necessary and impossible, she writes, she quoted for Bennett, to rewrite the default grammar of agency, a grammar that assigns activity to people and passivity, passivity to things. But why accept the limitations of this framework? Because she does not put into question the picture of agency on which she depends and which, by which she is obviously constrained, Bennett cannot think agency anew. The only move open to her is to distribute cause, ca redistribute causal agency to the non-human. That move does not only follow from her naturalistic premises, it arises from a normative impulse which, however, Bennett cannot express in normative terms. She claims that things call, things call for our attentiveness or even our respect. But what does it mean to say things call for our attentiveness and respect? I want to pause here for a moment and take a closer look at what is involved in understanding ourselves as called, as the addressees of a call. This call for attentiveness or respect is not just any kind of call. It is a normative call, a call demanding normative response. Why? Because it calls us to attend to how we're treating an other, to how we're living rightly or wrongly in, re in relation to it, potentially calling us to live differently. Moreover, it calls to a particular kind of being, not just any kind of being. It calls to a being capable of normative response, capable in the sense that it understands itself as called. And therefore, as called, it understands itself as answerable, even if, I, if, even if it might not to, if it, even if it might not to begin with, understand what the call is about or what it actually calls for in response. Curiously, in this respect, her book begins with just such a call for attentiveness and respect, provoked by the, slight, by the sight of miscellaneous objects contingently drawn together and caught in the grate of a, over a storm drain. What was caught? A dead rat, a stick of wood, a plastic glove, <laughs> some oak pollen, a plastic bottle cap. <clears throat> Struck by the sight of these things, Bennett comes to realize that things have a power of agency of their own, manifested in the effect they were having on her. Quoting, I caught a glimpse of an energetic vitality in each of these things, things I generally conceived as inert. Close quote. These objects, she came to see, were not just objects but they suddenly possessed the dignity of things 
and therefore called for attentive respect. Indeed, through this encounter, she glimpsed, quoting again, a culture of things irreducible to a culture of objects, things having dignity, objects having none. That she responded this way cannot be captured in causal terms alone. To be moved to see mere objects as things that have revelatory power, to see a culture of things and not just a culture of objects, is not merely an effect produced by some unexpected cause. There is a normative transformation of perception taking place, whereby objects become things not merely through their vitality, but through a normative revaluation, itself a consequence of a normative response to the call of things to attend to their thingliness, to see them as more than merely disposable, fungible objects. <coughs> Unfortunately, nowhere in her book does Bennett attend to the normative implications of this call which presupposes a normative relationship, not just a causal relationship between caller and called, and the normative being of the being who is called. For such a being, there is a question about how to respond and whose response is open to judgment about, about whether it was the right or wrong response, an adequate or inadequate response, a morally sensitive or morally insensitive response. Bennett's naturalistic commitments preclude normative considerations of this kind. She does speak of responsiveness in connection with Spinoza's account of affects, but the responsiveness she speaks of is construed naturalistically, not normatively, in other words, causally. She takes from Spinoza the idea of an affect as, quote, the capacity of any body for activity and responsiveness, close quote but there are all kinds of ways for one body to respond to another without involving or calling for normative response. The latter is not just another effect brought forth by the causal action of one body on another. In attentiveness to the normativity, to the normativity of the relationship between call and, res and response <coughs> is part of the reason why Bennett fails to see that there is no clear normative pathway from the recognition of the vibrant matter of things as such to a change in normative attitude toward the non-human. Clearly, I believe, we need a different approach from the one Bennett or Latour offer, an approach that does not rest content with distributing a flawed conception of human agency to non-human beings. We need an altogether different starting point, one, does not, one that does not unquestionably begin from the premise that agency is a kind of causality in the case of human beings, albeit a special kind of causality. We need to think about agency as something other and more than a form of causality. In short, we need to think of it as a form of normative responsiveness. What Bennett requires get, but cannot provide uh, is a view of agency as a normative response to a call from something or from someone. Understanding that which calls us and understanding ourselves as called are continuous with each other and at the same time are inseparable from a reflective awareness of and sensitivity to normative standards that are in play in how one responds. If we think of our agency as a form of normative responsiveness rather than a special kind of causality, we are on the way to a very different picture of agency that captures something distinctive about human agency without reinstating human exceptionalism. And I believe it opens up the possibility of thinking of non-human agency, non agency in a way that is not simply the extension of the causal picture to non-human agents. As an aside, I'm trying to work out that other picture in relation to some forms of non-human life, which I believe also have uh, uh, the capacity for normative response. I'm not 
arguing at all that this is an exclusively human capacity. I think it's an open question. What I'm suggesting here is part of an alternative picture of agency that has been proposed in different but overlapping ways in the tradition of philosophical romanticism and more recently in the work of Charles Taylor and Stanley Cavell in a large body of feminist scholarship and outside the academic world in centuries old indigenous practices of caring for the human and non-human world. As Charles Taylor puts it, what is crucial about aging is that things matter to them. Not that agents can do things and affect the things uh, they exercise uh, their agency upon, but that things matter to us. Agency is thereby reconceived as a kind of mattering, and we come to understand an agent essentially as a subject of significance. What is distinctive to human agency, quote, is that there are matters of significance for human beings which are peculiarly human and which get expressed in peculiarly human kinds of mattering. So that way we think of an agent as a respondent, not as a source of causality, but as a respondent, because things matter to a human agent in an original way. Contrabended, it is not the matter, vibrant or otherwise, but the mattering that is definitive of our responses to the human and the non-human. Human agency is distinguished not by some mark of superiority in the field of mattering, as though there could be a winner-loser contest over which species is better at caring about what matters to it. Unlike cases of con cognitive and linguistic performances, there is no performer standard for mattering in light of which human agency could be tested. As a matter of normative responsiveness, human agency is not about cognitive and linguistic superiority vis-a-vis non-human agents, but about how agents let things matter to them, especially things that didn't matter before, but have come to matter now, and come to matter now because of the mattering things they have become. Let me emphasize here that the responsiveness to what calls us is not exclusively to a human call. The call can come from anywhere, from anyone, from anything. What may be distinctively human is our responsiveness to what calls or our failure to be responsive, experience their shame, guilt, remorse, and so on. Our failure to count what calls us as one of our concerns as at which matters or should matter to us, and thus to regard our failure to be normatively responsive in this sense as a failure to let something matter, as a failure to care about what should matter to us. There's another section of the paper, but I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thank you for your patience and attention.